Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's an exciting day to be here, right? Yes. I will tell you, I'm feeling a little bit Canadian today for some reason. Well, somebody somebody asked if they you know have July Fourth in Canada. I said, how do you think they get from the third to the fifth? <laughs> And my nine-year-old grandson would say, that's a dad joke, but I don't think it's funny. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are laughing at it. That's good. It's a great day to worship the Lord. We celebrate together. Uh, would you please stand with me? And uh, Joe, would you come and do our opening prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together. We thank you that we can come together in your name, Father, to worship you, to lift up our voices to you, to learn, and to get encouragement and to give encouragement. Father, we ask for your blessing on this service and everything that we do in Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we are here on this earth. A force is always at work trying to cause us, an evil force, trying to cause us to make mistakes, to not follow our, our almighty God. But we serve a higher power. Our first song you might have heard, it's called Battle Belongs. You might have heard it on the radio if you listen to Christian music. And we are going to try to make a joyful noise and sing it. And sing it, and you join us, please. Battle Belongs. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Every fear I lay at 
at your feet, I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Next song I'd like to live, raise in worship to our Father, um, just a closer walk with thee. Oh. 
morning, body of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Today. Praise God, we're all here in his house, where we should be. I love when they sing music, it's so powerful. Nothing can stand against the power of God. It's a true statement. That's only when we are with God. So it's kind of important to be with God if we want to be victorious in all things. And we are when we are with God. But do we even know that? How do we know we're with God? And we might need some help. Get this open with God's help. I need some prayers. <laughs> it only happens when I'm up here with the speaker. I don't know what. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. Or... I have to take a moment before it goes everywhere. Uh, it's really hot in there, man. I have it halfway, Alan. I don't even have it up there. Thank you. You guys are saving lives up here, man. It could have been pretty brutal. <laughs> this is the time we set aside to remember the Lord. And this is not the only time we should be remembering the Lord every day, in every way, in everything we do. I'd like to read scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Well, we're kind of neck and neck on that one, but it is true. Jesus and the Lord, his, the Father, they've already won the war. All sin is forgivable if you get baptized and you follow the word and you obey the Father. <clears throat> so if you accept that you're a sinner, that's good. A lot of people have a hard time with it. I thought I, I did when I was younger. I thought I was a good person. But I didn't realize that that wasn't good enough to make it to heaven. There are things you got to do in order to make that journey. You bow your heads in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to you for your love, for your mercy, the gift of your Son and our salvation made possible through his sacrifice and his obedience. We pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters who are sick and those that are traveling. We pray for the, the war in Ukraine, Father. We pray for Russia, China, North Korea, the United States. A lot of hurting people out there, Father. We ask for relief and guidance for all. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, I hate to do that communion. Boy, I'll tell you that. That juice cup was killing me. Huh? Your sacrifice is already done. This is the second part of things that we remember for Jesus on communion. It's the offering. And you know, I was the only person once, a couple of years ago. And I didn't realize that, you know, I, I considered the offering just financial. But I've learned over the years that that's the least of it's important, yes, to keep the doors open. We love the building. But really, ultimately, it means nothing. It has no value. It's your soul that matters. And your salvation. Not just yours, but your neighbors. <coughs> Jesus did all the work. We just need to show up. All the work has been done. All the hard stuff. We just, not, we just need to get with the program. I'd like to read scripture for the offering from Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things all these things will be given to you as well those are all our needs so are you seeking the Lord first is the first question that's it's supposed to be free will so it's up to you <clears throat> your salvation literally is on the line and so is your neighbors don't hesitate to tell them. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for your Son, for our salvation. Help us, Father, 
to communicate clearly to the spirits and souls of our brothers and sisters who may not know you, Father. We ask that the word today that's spoken will penetrate their hearts and they will recognize the value of coming to you, Father, for salvation. We ask for this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, go for it. No. <laughs> I've got to be careful what I say here since my, my wife is leading that parade or one of the leaders of said parade. Uh, a few announcements. Um, first of all, this coming Tuesday is the 4th of July here in America, too. And so we will not have our regular Tuesday morning Bible study, but we'll pick back up next week. We will have Wednesday evening Bible study, and that's either here in the conference area, the office area, or uh, by Zoom, uh, if you'd like to join us for that. We're going to be starting 1 Corinthians this week. And so if you want to get in from the first stop there, join us. Love to have you. Um, Friday evening uh, this week will be our next Defending the Faith class. And again, by Zoom or in person. But uh, please join us. Uh, we'll, we'll have a good time talking about things that we need maybe answers to. And you might have questions. You know, uh, how do we believe in God when this happens in the world? Or how do I answer this question when somebody asks me about my faith or about God or about the Bible? Um, it's a great opportunity. It's the type of gathering that one question could have us put away whatever we were planning for that evening and deal with that question for the next hour. We're more than willing to do that because we want to kind of scratch where it itches and uh, help, help you where, where you're at. Um, Saturday is the next Ladies Bible Study, and uh, that'll be at 10 o'clock here at church. And uh, the last Saturday of the month, uh, today is the second, so at, okay, I guess, is that the 29th? Uh, anyways, the last Saturday of the month will be a work day. And so please come out and join us. Everything from uh, cleaning in the building to repairing things and getting things ready for the next thing or whatever. Uh, so please come out 8 o'clock. If you can stay an hour, stay an hour. Uh, if you're going to stay four hours, that'd be great too. Uh, any other announcements? Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, let's take a look at our prayer list. Uh, you can see opportunities for prayer. Uh, You're going to have to help me out on some of these. I was gone for a week. I'm like a trained monkey. you got to retrain me all over again. Um, Cameron, have you heard anything from Jimmy in the last couple of days? No. Okay. I saw him years ago at the Alpha Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we asked for prayer for Jimmy over the last couple of weeks and got a good report from him. The last thing I heard a couple of two or three days ago. So please continue to, to pray for Jimmy. Um, I put uh, my friend Alan on the prayer list a few weeks ago. Alan's doing much better, praise God for that. Um, Susan M, I've, I've not heard anything more about. I think she's got uh, uh, kidney cancer surgery on the 24th of this month. Uh, continue to pray for Birdie. She had a birthday this week, but uh, continue to lift her up. Um, Yvonne has asked for prayer for a couple people um, this week. so. And Yvonne, I see one, I see Penny on here, and uh, Olisa. Are, are, are those the two that you've asked, or are there additional? Yeah, Lisa said the Illinois uh, chief sounded like a new friend. When I met her, she was talking about the suicide. Okay. Uh, so she, she uh, understands about God. Yeah. Uh, I see Mike S. Is that you? No. Mike S. Who's Mike S.? Mark Jordan. He lost his father. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Like I said, I've been on vacation. My brain just ain't what it used to be. Not that it ever was. Yes, for Mike Shorter with the loss of his father. That's that's correct. Thank you. Um, any other um, prayer needs or praises today? All right. Let's pray. Father, you know our needs before we ask. 
Help us to ask anyways. Help us to show our trust in you and, and the way that you help us through every situation and circumstance. Father, you know the, the joys of our hearts. You know our praises. You know the answered prayers that we see when, when we pay attention. Help us to praise you always. Thank you, Father, for the joy that we have, even things that bring us happiness. But Father, help us to find contentment in you so that we can draw near. Father, we can share the hope that we have so that others can draw near. Father, you will help us to grow your kingdom if we keep an open heart and mind, if we pray for those who are lost. Father, right now, help us to pray for one or two or three people by name who are outside of your kingdom. <clears throat> Father, help us to live the courage that comes when your Holy Spirit emboldens us. Help us to live the courage of the message of hope that no one else has if they don't have Jesus. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for watching over us, for helping us. Father, as we are gathered here today, help us to open our hearts and our minds to your word, to the leading of your spirit, wherever that takes us, so that we would truly be the people you want us to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I've talked a couple times about being gone over the last couple weeks. That's not a big surprise. But what, what happened when we first left? Uh, Sharon and our daughter Sarah and the kids, they headed north. Uh, Sarah and her husband Josh were going to a wedding on Saturday up in Grand Rapids. So they headed for Michigan. Josh had to work on Thursday. So Friday morning early, he and I left and we headed for Cincinnati. And you're like, Cincinnati, Michigan. Well, there was a baseball game. We had to go. The Braves were in Cincinnati. Now, I don't care for the Braves that much, but my son-in-law, Josh, does. And I like baseball. And we used to live in Cincinnati, and I had been to some games there long ago and rooted for the Reds and had favorite play. Now, anyways, so the game is going to be Friday night. We're leaving here 7 o'clock Friday morning. We get there at 6 o'clock for a 640 game. But on... Um, Wednesday night, Josh was check, checking for tickets and there were tickets available. But the Reds were in the middle of an 11 game winning streak and everybody in Cincinnati, plus people in Northern Kentucky and, and Southeastern Indiana, wanted to go to the game. And so on Thursday night when Josh checked, there were no seats available. And so he bought standing room only. Now, can you imagine what standing room only means? It means we don't got no place to sit. I missed having a, a chair, a seat, uh, call it what you want. And so for the six innings that we were there, and Josh was getting pretty tired, and it was an exciting game, but we wanted to get out of there before traffic, you know, got because 50,000 people in downtown Cincinnati and all that. And so we left a little early, but for six innings, we stood. Even when we got our food, and we had Skyline Chili, by the way, there in the stadium. Some of you are aware of Skyline Chili. And, but we stood to eat our Skyline Chili. We had no seat. And what I realized was that every sporting event I'd ever been to in my whole life, and I'd been to sold out games in Cincinnati before, by the way. I was there for Johnny Mench night. And some of you are like, who, what? Hall of Fame catcher, last game he was ever going to play. The pitcher threw him an underhand pitch and he hit it for a home run on his last at bat. Well, it wasn't quite underhand, but almost. And the game was sold out. But I had a seat. I've been to pro football games in college and high school. I always had a seat. I've been to baseball games at a number of levels, basketball games, hockey games, soccer games. I always had a seat. Until last Friday night, a week ago. I missed having a seat, and I realized that I had always taken for granted that I would have a seat. How often do we take God for granted? We come to church, we pray, 
we read our Bibles, we pray, we talk to people about church and about God. And, you know, we quite often we are, are engaged with God. Quite often we think about who he is and what he does for us. And, and we read his word and we memorize it sometimes, right? And, and just in every aspect of life, much of the time, we're fully open-hearted to God. But not always. I dare say that when we come to church, even there are times that we're in the right place, at the right time, even doing the right things. Boo! Now, don't tell me you're never there. If you tell me you're never there, that's fine. But, you know, for most of us, that's right, that's right. And I've given you permission during my sermons because I know my sermons can be kind of long sometimes and I know that, uh, you know, it gets a little warm in here sometimes. And so it's okay if your mind wanders during the sermon. But what I want to point out is that sometimes singing is worship. Sometimes praying is worship. Sometimes uh, giving is worship. Sometimes being in the word is worship. But it's when we are fully engaged with God, that's when it's worship. It's understanding who God is, the difference he makes in us and in our lives day by day. We need to worship him day by day, not just on Sunday, not just in this place, not just the, with the things that we typically consider church. But there are many times that as we go through life, we see God at work and we need to praise God in that moment. And, and it might be, you know, driving down the highway and seeing an array of color. On the, on the side of the hill or the mountain or whatever, or seeing somebody helping somebody else that you say, people just don't do that. That must be God at work. There's so many ways that we can worship God. So many times that we need to lift up our hearts and be open to what God is teaching us. And it might be that there are thoughts that we have that are destructive thoughts about ourselves or about other people, that when we surrender them to God and, and receive God's help, that we are worshiping him because we're putting our trust in him. So to sum up, that makes it sound like we're almost done, doesn't it? Sorry. <laughs> when we're here, worship. Open your heart to him. Concentrate, think about, meditate on, on the things of God. Day by day, worship God. Think about him. Concentrate. Learn more about him from being in his word. Learn more about him by listening for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit as he helps us day by day. Sometimes even moment by moment. Listen for what God is willing and able to do in you. Quite often we take for granted God's help God's mercy, God's truth. Quite often we take for granted God's worthiness of my praise and God's accessibility in my prayers. We ought never to take those for granted. We ought to praise God for each one of those, consider how they impact our lives. Yesterday, I was getting my tire work done. Some of you have heard that when I got home from vacation, I had a flat tire in my car sitting in the driveway. Took the tire off, took it down to, uh, well, they used to call it tread quarters. I don't know what they call it now. Oh, yeah. And uh, while I was there, there was a gentleman who came in and as he walked past me, and I, and I like to read people's shirts. And the gentleman's shirt said, worship, is a lifestyle. I like that. Because yes, this is part of our lifestyle, right? Worshiping. But this isn't the only place we worship or the only way that we worship. So what is worship? Worship is acknowledging God, praising God, recognizing that he is worthy of our praise and recognizing is not simply a mental decision or an assent, if you will, 
but it's in our hearts and it's in our lives. I've already mentioned a number of different ways that we can worship that really have nothing to do with being in this building or singing certain songs or taking certain emblems or those kind of things. We need to make sure that, that we are engaged with him and that he is growing us and changing us. As I said, worship is acknowledging that God is worthy of our praise and using our lives as a praise to God. One of the things that's important in this equation is that we grow in our knowledge of God. And I recommend that, that you, from time to time, read the Psalms. Other passages work as well, but the Psalms are kind of concentrated. There's my friend Avi back there. <laughs> He says, people are looking. I'm not going to make that noise now. <laughs> we love these kids, I'll tell you. I don't even know what I was saying there. But that's my fault, not hers. When we grow in our knowledge of God, and if you look at the way David and the rest of the psalmist, David wrote about half the psalms, maybe a little bit more. We look at the way that they talk about God, talk to God, recognize, praise God. It expands our understanding of who God is. We can read in the New Testament. We can see what Jesus did and the way people reacted to him, even the way Jesus talked to the Father. And we'll look at that more in depth in a few minutes. But to understand that God is merciful and we need mercy. We spoke in Sunday school this morning out of 1 John chapter 1 about, you know, if we say we have not sinned, we call God a liar. If we confess our sins to him, he forgives our sins. Friends, that's mercy. That is what we need as much or more than anything else. So much of our lives and to know that God is accessible to us. We are in Daniel chapter 6. And Daniel 6 is about Daniel and the lion's den. But I don't know that that's the most important thing there. We're actually going to start at the end of Daniel chapter 5. And over the course of the book of Daniel, there are four kings that are mentioned. We talked the last number of weeks about Nebuchadnezzar, before last week, of course. Uh, Dave Bateman spoke about a different king, Hezekiah, one of my favorites. And Hezekiah is too. Uh, but after Neb Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar, or something like that, yeah, yeah, Belshazzar, uh, comes up, and he's only a short few chapters there in Daniel, and then he dies. Well, let's take a look at these verses, Daniel 5, 29 to 31. And by the way, you'll notice some of the passages I reference are a little bit different than what's on the screen. That's not Rhonda's fault, that's my fault. Been a little scatterbrained the last few days, but that's all right. Lots going on. Uh, Daniel 5, 29 to 31. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel uh, had interpreted uh, a, a, a supernatural happening of writing on the wall. And Daniel was able to tell the king what it meant, what it was about, all that good stuff. That very night, verse 30 says, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. I believe that was part of what the writing on the wall was. <clears throat> and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I'm not sure why Darius' age is included there. Is he saying, hey, he was really old? Or he was the perfect age? I, I, I have no idea. Must be it. Must be three years younger than the perfect age. How about that? Yeah, well, yeah. So now we have Darius. And some things are exactly the same with Darius that they were with Nebuchadnezzar and probably Belshazzar. And what that means is that some people were jealous and they were upset that they could not climb the ladder of success in that kingdom because Daniel and earlier Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing in the way. And so people are being ugly, they're being mean, they're being political. 
The same stuff that happens in Washington, D.C., and Richmond, and probably in your city hall, wherever you live today. I don't know that anyone gets thrown to the lions or in a fiery furnace today, but they might as well, right? For what other people try to do to their career. People can be ugly, right? Let me get on the right page here. Ah, yes. Let's take a look at Daniel 6, 3 and 4 and see some of this ugliness. Now, Daniel was so distinguished, or <laughs> Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Ah, so he went from number three, probably didn't call him number two, right? Because the king is still the king. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Don't you just hate that, an honest public servant? Somebody who can't be bought or doesn't try to buy off other people or whatever. Daniel worked hard and worked smart. And he was God's man. We've talked about that in recent weeks as well, haven't we? And for Daniel to be God's man meant that, that he was going to be honest. And he was going to be courageous and do the right thing no matter what. And that is what leads to trouble. Let's take a look at, at Daniel 6, 10 through 12. Uh, 10 through 13. I changed that one too. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... That is the, the lion's den thing, you know. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and disobeyed the king's order. All right, I just gave you the rough paraphrase there. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to, to his God just as he had done before. And honestly, almost certainly he prayed out loud. And in the way they built houses and, and buildings and such back then, other people could hear him praying. Then, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? <coughs> the king answered, well, yeah, I guess I kind of did, yeah. The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So let it be written, so let it be done. Oh, wait, that was Pharaoh, wasn't it? Close enough. Then they said to the king, Daniel, <coughs> who is one of the exiles, or at least foreigners <coughs> from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays to his God three times a day. I suppose if he bowed down and said, O king, I know that you're really a God and you can hear me, but he didn't. Daniel knew who the one true God was, the, the God that he was raised worshiping and serving, learning about. Uh, and now here he is, a middle-aged man or so, and he's still worshiping God. Has he had problems in his life? Sure, he's had other people oppose him. His friends were throwing the fiery furnace. I mean, all these things that have happened in Daniel's life. But these enemies, they're coming after him. Because if they can move him out of the way, one of them will get the top spot. <clears throat> now, it's one of the kids trying to escape, or one of the teachers, <laughs> I don't know. Guys, we're talking about Daniel and the lion's den, if you've ever heard that story. So, Daniel chapter 6. I've said maybe the lions aren't the most important part. Our lesson today is that prayer 
is worship. Prayer is worship. It's not just an exercise in mumbling to ourselves or talking to the ceiling. It's, it's not just the specific requests or praises or prayer concerns that we have. It's much more so about humbling ourselves before God, showing our need for God. And I like to put it in these terms first, because if we don't pray, that means we are not humbling ourselves before God and we're not showing our need for God. And that's, that means that we can do it all ourselves. Except we can't. We need God, don't we? And so we need to be praying. And prayer doesn't have to be this long. And it doesn't have to be this fancy. I mean, big words are fine. Some people are more comfortable praying in King James. Thee, thy, thou. Fee, fi, fo, fum, whatever. And that's fine. Because, you know, God even speaks Old English. It's important for us to recognize who God is and that he is worthy of our praise. And if I don't say this at least 10 or 15 times in this sermon, I've let you down. That's at least seven. And so whether we get down on our knees the way Daniel did, whether we lay out before God, I tend to fall asleep if I do that, so I'm not real crazy about that for myself most of the time. Unless it's really uncomfortable, then it's hard to sleep. Whether we stand with our hands raised to heaven, as long as our hearts are humble before God. And so Daniel prayed. And it didn't matter what the king said, and it didn't matter what the punishment was going to be. He was going to pray because he needed God. And he humbled himself before God. When we pray, it shows that we trust God with our, our needs, with our particulars, with our situations. And I've had people ask me even recently, is, is it, what, what do I do when I'm angry with God? I say, tell him. It's okay to be angry at God. It's okay to shout at God. It's okay to raise your fist in the air. Honestly, when you do that, you realize how puny your fist is. Sorry. A lot of times when I raise my hands during a song, it, it's usually where the word holy is in the song. Interestingly enough, there's something about that that humbles me, drives me to praise God. Hand up or hand down doesn't matter. But I realize when I reach up toward God how small my hand is and how much I need God. When people are angry at God, be angry. Tell God he knows it already. But then look to God for the answers and for the help for us to understand and to find answers that help us get through the anger. It is possible. When we pray, we see God at work. We see God at work in our prayers and the way God answers them. We see God at work in the way he doesn't answer them right away, frequently. God's timing is not my timing. His timing is perfect, mine is not. I wanted it yesterday. By the way, Abraham was 75 when God said, um, you're going to have a son. Ten years later, Sarah, his wife, was impatient and gave her servant girl to Abraham to have a child with. Don't know if she asked the servant girl or not. That seemed to be a mistake on any number of levels. The descendants from that Servant girl to dare the enemies of Israel. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm. But after 25 years, in other words, Abraham was about 100, God fulfilled his promise. 
and Isaac was born. A lot of times we push for something and if we got it right now, it would be wrong. It wouldn't help, it would hurt, it would, who knows what? Well, God knows what. So it's important for us to trust God and to see God at work at the right time. So how do we pray? Quite often we pray, I don't want to say selfishly, because that's such a fine line. Because we're allowed to pray for ourselves. But I would suggest that if we pray for ourselves and, and even people we love dearly, outside of the context of God's will, we're probably making a mistake. In other words, God, if it is your will, please take this from me. I think Jesus said that, didn't he, in one of his prayers? And then Jesus said, but not my will, your will be done. There's a lesson in there somewhere. So praying for ourselves, praying for others, but quite often we begin with praying for people and we end praying with people. So let, let's look at it differently. Let's use the word acts, A-C-T-S. I mean, A-X would be a shorter sermon, I realize, but that's okay. Um, and I didn't make this up. I can't remember where I first heard it at least 30 years ago. And I, maybe it's been around for hundreds of years for all I know. So how do we pray acts? Number one, A is adoration. We start with praising God. We start with recognizing who God is. That goes back to the Psalms again, seeing who God is in the scripture, seeing what God does, all these kinds of things. Start with adoration. The letter C in Acts stands for confession. Confession is two things. One is I confess my sin, my weakness, my, my need for his help. Secondly, I, I confess that Jesus is my Lord and I need him every day, every hour, every minute. So confession can be a couple of things. T stands for thanksgiving. Now, in a sense, adoration and thanksgiving are similar, but not entirely so, because when I give thanks, I give thanks for who God is and what he does. And I want that coming through my mind, out my mouth if I'm praying out loud. I want to make certain that I'm thanking God every day. And his mercies are new every, every day. I think that's the unit of time in Lamentations 3. New every morning, isn't it? Okay. Every morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be every day. The S in Acts stands for supplication. That's a big fancy word for praying for others and praying for yourself. Now, it doesn't have to be in this structure. But to have a, a prayer that... To have a prayer life that is complete, we need to include these elements in our prayers. We don't have to pray each one of these four in every prayer. That's what I'm trying to avoid saying. But it's the idea that if all I'm doing is saying, God, gimme, 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 that's not very healthy, is it? I'm not seeking God's will. I'm not praying for others. I'm not giving God thanks. I'm not confessing my sin or my need for Jesus, not giving adoration. It's important that I grow and become more mature in the way that I pray and my attitude about prayer and my understanding. Jesus prayed. <laughs> Hopefully that's not news. <laughs> Let's take a look at five or six places where Jesus prayed. And there are probably a couple dozen more that are specifically mentioned. That, that's all right. Mark chapter one, obviously the beginning of Mark's gospel. Says starting with verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. Simon is Peter. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody's looking for you. I think Jesus knew that already, right? Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can proclaim the message there. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues 
and driving out demons. This began a new phase of ministry for Jesus, a new direction, a, a new way of going about things. He's been kind of gathering people, you know, the, the, uh, the disciples, and some he will choose as the 12 apostles. And, and so that was kind of the first phase, if you will. Now he's traveling around different places and he's teaching and he's driving out demons and healing people. And it starts when he spends that extra time in prayer. Now I say extra, maybe there were a lot of times that Jesus went off in the middle of the night to pray. But it seems like it surprises Peter and the rest. But whatever it was, uh, Jesus is going to seek the will of the Father. Is this the time? Tell me where to go. What am I supposed to do with these guys? You know, I'm sure Jesus prayed about all that. Let's go to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and following. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to them and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who is called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So before Jesus does his, uh, his uh, player draft here, goes off by himself, spends the night in prayer. One lesson here is that Jesus thought prayer was more important than sleep. How about us? Are there times that we stay up extra late because we're praying so much or get up extra early? Maybe there's so much on our hearts, so much in our minds that getting up at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, spending extra time in prayer, is, is that early, early or not too bad? That, that's early. What I know I know some of you are early birds. Yeah. yeah. But Jesus had a huge decision to make. Did, did he know Judas was going to be the traitor? Was, was that where he spent extra time in prayer? Did he know Peter had a big mouth and was constantly going to be sticking his foot in it? That Thomas was going to be a doubter? Did he want one of those on the team? Apparently the father said yes. Let's go to Mark 6. 45 and 46. I added another verse here. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Mountainsides were rather inaccessible to the crowds. I picture Jesus sending the guys away in the boat, sending the crowd away and kind of disappearing over this way going up where he could be alone. This was right after uh, various things had taken place, right after John the Baptist was executed, right after the 12 had gone out and come back. So that was a good thing, but it was draining. Right after he had fed 5,000 and he needed to be alone. But being alone, whether it was accompanied by sleep, definitely was about prayer. We're seeing a pattern here, aren't we? Jesus humbled himself before the Father. We could, we could look at, at Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 8. I think I referenced that a couple weeks ago. But it talks about Jesus humbling himself, taking on the form of a man. Becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Then seeing the Father exalt him. That every knee should bow, every tongue confess. But it's because Jesus humbled himself. When we pray, we humble ourselves. That's the best way to pray, at least. Most honest way. But Jesus needed that time with his heavenly father. I need that time with my heavenly father. You need that time with your heavenly father. And I know life is very busy. You know, some jobs are, are 12 and 14 hours a day. You know, some families are, are never stop till everybody drops in the, in the evening time and then wakes up early. I, I get it. 
It's not easy to do these things many, many times. And again, it's not about, hey, I can, if I can't spend six hours in prayer, I'm not going to start at all. No. Start with 10, 15 minutes. Pray, read some scripture, pray. Expand that, see it grow. Find the best time for you. Find the best way to connect with your heavenly father so that he can be at work in you all day long, all week long. Mark chapter 8, 6 and 7. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. Now, the first time he fed 5,000, this time he's feeding 4,000. And notice, he takes time to pray. He takes time to give thanks. I remember when my family first started becoming Christians, my mom and dad were first, the end of October, about 50 years ago. And we would go into restaurants and, and we kind of bow our heads like this. Amen. We've never seen anyone pray in restaurants before. We didn't know if they'd kick us out. I don't think that was part of it. And then, some of my mom and dad's friends from high school who had been big boozers, but they came to Christ and my mom and dad helped them dump their booze down the sink. I remember that story very well. <laughs> they came over to Detroit where we were now living and we went into a restaurant and this guy reaches out his hands. No, oh, we hide when we pray. And everybody grabbed hands and, and he said, Dear Lord, we thank you for this food. You provide so what, whatever he said in his prayer. And we're like, wow, you're allowed to do that? Yeah. Well, yeah. See, you're smarter than I was. There's nothing too little to thank God for. And nothing too big. Nothing too little to bring to him. And nothing too big. Jesus knew that the 4,000 were going to be fed. But to thank God shows that he knows where this is coming from. It's not his power as a man that's dividing the, the fish and the loaves all these different ways and everybody gets fed. It's all about what the Father does through him. Yeah. Yeah. That means apply it to yourselves and to me. I, I think you got that part, right? Mark chapter 14. Now, Mark only has 16 chapters, so this is getting toward the end, obviously. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John, we talked about that this morning, along with him uh, during Sunday school, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, <clears throat> he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was not committing suicide. Jesus was surrendering his life to the will of the Father, whatever that meant, whatever it took. He was going to do it. And so in this case, it would mean going to the cross for his, his blood to be shed, for his life to flow away. Jesus talked about the resurrection, but... You know, in that moment, when he is just hours from the cross, could there have been some doubts? Could there have been some questions? How is this going to work? You know, with Lazarus, I was there. And, and, and with that widow of Nain, you know, I was there. And I doubt that Jesus got that detailed with it. But just the recognition. Father, if there's a different way to do this, let's do it differently. But not my will. Your will be done. 
Now, it's just as much a prayer to say thank you for the loaves and the fish and thank you for helping select the 12 apostles and the direction for the ministry. All these things are all, Father, I humble myself before you because I need you. I praise your name. I thank you for what you do. I worship you. That's why prayer is worship. Let's go to Daniel 6, 16 to 23. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. Ah, so the king didn't want him to die. The king realized Daniel's important to his kingdom. The king realized that he got tricked, and Daniel got trapped. But Daniel wasn't going to do anything other than what honored God. He would pray. He would worship God. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Do you think he might have prayed? I suspect so. At first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from these starving lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And Daniel was lifted from the den. No wound was found on him because he had trusted his God. By the way, the bad guys get thrown in. And before they hit the ground, the lions eat them. Now, do you think during that night, you think Daniel prayed? Do you think that the, the lions kind of came over and nudged against him, hoping that maybe their mouths would open and they, they could get a meal? Maybe. Who knows? What do you think Daniel was thinking about? Yeah, thinking about God. Realizing how much he needed God in that immediate moment and every other moment of life. When I was writing this, this message, Actually, when I was done writing, sometimes God taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, you missed something. Rhonda, you're not going to find this on, on your screen there, but Psalm 3. Years ago, Sharon and I were in a cantata, that is a singing music program, and one of the songs that we sang was Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes, how many rise up against me, Many are saying of me, God does not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, <clears throat> my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I awake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side, or in this case, lions. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. You'll notice I resisted singing that song. But because of that song, that scripture's in my mind. Lord, are they increased that trouble me. Many are they that rise up against me. Many are they that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. If you want to read a couple other Psalms that David was probably thinking about, look at Psalm 91 and 92. We won't take the time to go there right now. But Daniel had a moment, had a nighttime, where God showed himself in a very specific way. The mouths of the lions never opened to eat him. 
or to harm him. God was there. God helped. Daniel had joy at God's protection. God answered Daniel's prayer. Daniel had more confidence in God than ever before. He saw God at work. Now, now that's kind of a conclusion on my part. But how could he not have more confidence? We need to have more confidence in God when we read the scripture and see what God does. Amy Grant sang a song a number of years ago talking about God's protection, about the speeding car that ran out of gas just before it came her way, things like that. It's a pretty neat song. Friday in the car on the way home, listening to a Christian station out of Fredericksburg, the, the uh, talkers there on the radio were talking about an hallelujah moment, and a hallelujah moment when, when something happens and you just know that it's God right there. And Daniel had a hallelujah moment, a praise to God for everything he does. You remember back with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said our God will protect us, but even if he doesn't, we're going to praise him. That's the attitude. That's our desire. That's our plan, our commitment. To always, always, Always look to him and to praise his name. Let's have our hallelujah moments so that we lift up the name of God and worship him. I don't think there's anything else to say. Acknowledge who God is and what he's done for us. He is worthy of our praise and heart, mind, and life. Let's worship him. Father, you are the awesome one. You've given us everything that we need. You help us every day. Father, I ask that you would be with those who are uncertain about their salvation. Whether they're on the internet watching, whether they're here in this room, Father, help us to seek out the answers from your word. Father, let us find someone who can help us so that we can look at, at your plan together. Thank you, Father, for what Jesus has done, dying on Calvary's cross for us. Thank you for being with us this day. Father, I pray for our country as we celebrate this, this birthday coming up on 250 years and a few years here. But Father, I pray that we would repent of our sins as a nation and draw near to you once again. Thank you, Father. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Is there anything else that needs to be said today? Thank you, everyone, and God bless.